today we'll have a, a sort of a continuation of what we had done during the whole month of July. If uh, you remember when uh, we came back from our sabbatical, I spent two Sundays uh, preaching about the love of God. Uh, that is something that touched my heart very deeply and I just uh, understood that this is something that we really need to get much deeper in understanding and what is the most important in practical application. We need to know what it is. We need to understand how large the love of God is, how much our lives depend on understanding of who He is and how much He loves us and that He loved us in Christ Jesus. So it means that He loves us exactly with the same level of kind of love as He loves His only begotten Son. And this is something that we need to go deeper and deeper. And um, yesterday we, uh, we touched another facet of the same truth which is revealed in the very interesting passage. It is found in the Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. This is the last, last verse of two epistles. You know that the church at Corinth it was one of the more difficult churches, a lot of problems were there. And uh, Paul is addressing the church. He actually visited them several times, and he had written to them four epistles, all, four letters all together. Uh, by the providence of the Holy Spirit, we have only two of them surviving, and only two of them obviously had been uh, God-breathed or Spirit-breathed. So this is why we have two, First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. So, and Paul is addressing those church, that church, those believers, and he is pointing to many different things, many different aspects, helping them to gain or regain the real deep love of uh, communion with God and understanding the gospel and practical application of that spiritual freedom that we receive from the Lord. But at the very end, kind of summing up the whole thing, uh, Paul decided to point those believers to three major elements of spiritual reality. Actually, these three elements, they are uh, vital characteristics of the Holy Trinity which are expressed or actually continue being expressed to us. And this is a point of connection between us as believers and the Holy Trinity, the great God, that great triune God who had created everything and saved us and He is continuing to work with us so you and I may have connection with Him. And that connection is in those following characteristics. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is number one. We were talking about that yesterday in detail uh, at the, in the morning service, and then I hope that you had an opportunity to discuss that between each other when, when you fellowship during the day. And then at the evening, if you remember who had been at the evening service, we were uh, giving practical examples how we as pastors experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. So that was, that was yesterday. And as I just mentioned, we spent two services, two, two sermons uh, in the beginning of months um, discussing the love of God, and the love of the Father toward us. And today we will focus our time on the third one, which is uh, no less important. It's the, the last here, but not least, definitely not least. It is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. As I just mentioned that this is a point where theology translates into the practice, where truth produces the real life. And this is, as I just mentioned, this is one of the greatest necessities for all of us. Uh, the contemporary Christianity is known, first of all, by superficiality. So a lot of Christians, so those people who call themselves Christians, they are just uh, go through the motions. 
And there, are different, there is different group, those people who are interested in the truth, and though they go deeper into theological things, but unfortunately, many of those who belong to that group, they never come to the point where their theology meets the rubber. I mean, the rubber meets the rod. The theology meets the practice. And because of that, they look like people with huge heads and very small hearts and undeveloped feet. They, they just and legs. They just cannot walk. They, they just don't know what it is. And in order to avoid that, in order to correct that, let, let's focus on uh, this uh, uh, very, very important truth which is practically related to us. When we uh, started this month uh, with the sermon on the love of the Father, we started it with the first John. First John chapter 1, and go with me to that, uh, uh, those verses. We will read verses 1 through 4. And uh, John was explaining the reality of life which he wanted to communicate to the people who lived at that time. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So he's explaining that Jesus brought to us here the eternal life from the Father. And he is saying, we saw that, we touched that, we actually gazed upon that, we spent time with that, we know that life. And now, in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And, when, uh, and, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So fellowship is the key word here. Actually, if you would look at this verse uh, or these verses uh, again, you can uh, find here several times where uh, Apostle is saying, so that you... In the beginning, he says, we proclaim this word to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and our fellowship with our Father. And then look at verse 4. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So he is including them with himself or himself with them. So he is saying that there is a certain dynamic, there is a certain connection, relationship between Christ, and then Christ had fellowship with the apostles, and apostle had written this word, and now they communicated it to us so that we have fellowship with them, so that we have complete joy, have that freedom, have that real life, the sense of real life that God had brought to us through Jesus Christ. So the the key element here is what is that connector, what connects us, and the connector is fellowship. When we were discussing these verses, I mentioned the, the very important element that we need to understand, that fellowship is not just spending time together. Quite often people today They minimize or actually have completely wrong concept, wrong idea of the word fellowship. So they are thinking fellowship as getting together or hanging out or conversing with each other or spending time together. It is possible to have all of that and not having fellowship. Fellowship is, a, in the original, is a Greek word, kainenia, which is re, translated as relationship, characterized by sharing in common. So it's much deeper. Or another lexicon uh, translates, like, translates it like that, an association involving close mutual relationship and involvement. So fellowship plays a huge role in the life of the believer and in the life of the church as body of Christ, as the um, 
temple of Christ, temple of God. So the writers of various books today on the development of the church and Christian life are fond of mentioning that. This is a very popular word today, fellowship and community, uh, especially at our times. And they are using that word, uh, loading it with a very... Uh, very wrong ideas, very wrong concepts. And today especially, people elevate the idea of fellowship above the worship services, above the reading of God's Word, about spending time in prayer together. They, they would say, no, we will have fellowship, whatever it means. It means most often just empty time together. Just people are hanging out. People are just spending time watching movies or, or doing something, and they would have, it's fellowship, it's a community, but this is not the idea that God is expressing here. And, and we need to go deeper to, in order to understand what is spirit-produced fellowship, which is capable of producing the real deep life. Deep spiritual life, real life of God in our lives. This is what uh, Paul is uh, explaining here. It's here. It's kind of difficult concept, and there is one uh, one problem is that in that the, the difficulty of the fellowship of the Spirit is that we don't feel and don't see and don't experience the Spirit Himself. We can experience and we actually will always experience the result of the work of the Spirit. But as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, you remember, He explained him, uh, He compared Spirit with the wind. He said that you cannot see the wind, but you can see how uh, leaves are blown by, by, the, by the wind. You can see results of the Spirit, but you cannot have feeling. Some people say, I felt the presence of the Spirit. No, no, you cannot feel it. You can be aware of that, and we'll be talking about that. But you cannot feel the Spirit. There are many things which we as believers experience when we are interacting or the Holy Spirit interacts with us. First, we are born by the Spirit, born again by the Spirit. There is no other way for a believer, for a person to become a believer without the direct supernatural work of the Spirit in our lives. Jesus was explaining that John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus is uh, talking to Nicodemus, and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is very clear. If you became a believer, it's a direct result of the work of the Holy Spirit. You never felt that. But you have the result. And the result means that you are a child of God. You want to do what God wants from you. You, want to, you have that, that uh, you know, attraction to, toward the word of God, toward the will of God. And sin is making your life uncomfortable. This is the result of being born again. Then Ephesians 1.13, we read that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit... In him you also, when you, have, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And no one had experienced that spiritual sealing, that moment that Spirit just placed a seal upon, upon your, your soul. But all of us are sealed by the Spirit, which means that he marked us, and we forever are his. That's what, what the scripture tells us. Then we are baptized or immersed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So the Holy Spirit at the moment when he regenerates the soul connects that soul supernaturally to everyone else who are born of the Spirit in the same way. 
That's, that's the supernatural work, and we don't see it. But what we have, you know, we know the difference that we have. Whenever you are or whoever will become a true believer, if you, you are somewhere, uh, my wife and I spent time uh, in Europe uh, during the sabbatical, and, and that was a very interesting experience when you meet another believer. You never see him or her, but you are like that. You feel that, you know, that this is part of the same body. This is a soul which is close to you. Why? Because we have the same spirit. We love the same Lord. We read the same word of God. We pray together. So this is what happens when we are immersed into the... We are baptized by the Spirit. We are immediately made one with all the people who belong to Christ. So the Holy Spirit transforms us from within. Ephesians 2, verses 19, we read that we are no, no longer strangers or aliens, and we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house, household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the temple, a holy temple of the Lord, in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place before God by the Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit is continuously working on us, making us more suitable to be a part of God's temple. So this is all we cannot feel, but we experience the result all the time. And because of that, it is quite difficult to understand what is the fellowship of the, of the Spirit. But when we read this verse, and let's go back to that verse, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. When we read this verse, we see that subjective work of the Spirit, which we can feel, actually, which we can experience. And that's the point which we, we just cannot afford to miss. This is something that we really need, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Just a few observations before we will dive deeper into that concept. The first, what we see here, the Holy Spirit. It's, it is just not a superficial spirituality. Some kind of Emotional conditions or ecstatic experience that people have. No, no, we are talking about the Trinity. We are talking about God himself. We are, talk, we are talking about great God, the creator of the universe, and the Holy Spirit is the third person of that Holy Trinity. So he is talking not about pocket God that we have, in order to fulfill our desires or, or to elevate our mood. No, no, no. This is not something like that. We are talking about great God. We are talking about part of the Holy Trinity. And that Holy Trinity, because of what Jesus Christ had done for you and me at the cross, that Holy Trinity now wants to interact with you. As I just mentioned, it's not something minimized. No, He is the same greatness God. He is the same unreachable God. The same God uh, with the, in, the, in the presence of whom the heaven and earth trembles. And now this God has fellowship with you. It's a holy Spirit. Secondly, fellowship or kainenia, it's an essential quality of the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just mentioned that kainenia speaks about, about deep fellowship, but it's still fellowship. Fellowship means interaction. Fellowship means real connection. Meaningful, conscious, connection. So that means the 
God himself, the Holy Trinity, through the person, third person of the Trinity, comes to us to connect with us, to connect with your soul, to interact with us. So this is what it means, fellowship here. He is the spirit of fellowship. He connects the soul to the living God. Number three, what we see here. Look at the last word, with you all. It's not, it's not something with, with, which belongs to, to the apostles or to the super Christians today. And most of us would say, yeah, of course, there are some Christians that are really spiritual. But they, they know what it is. No, look what he's writing here. The fellowship of the Spirit will be with you all. And he's writing to Corinthians. And you remember the story there. There are a lot of problematic people. But when he starts that epistle, first and second, he greets them as saints. Yeah, troubled saints. Yeah, failing saints quite often. But they are saints. And this is why he ends his epistle with that very interesting and very powerful statement. The fellowship of the Spirit will be with you all. I want to remind you that the fellowship of the Spirit is essential for the uh, having abundant life that we just mentioned. Uh, let's go back to First John uh, uh, 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son so that our joy may be complete. So unfortunately, as I just mentioned, that uh, many, many Christians today, they don't know what is fellowship of the Spirit. Instead, they either not have any fellowship at, uh, at all, or they have something that they substitute. They have some trivial get-together. Quite often, it's very shallow, very superficial, without any idea or concept of the Spirit in that, and they call it community. And they call it fellowship. They call it something spiritual. But the end result, unfortunately, doesn't, doesn't matter what you call fellowship, but if you don't have fellowship of the Spirit, you will never experience that abundant life of complete joy and real freedom that was brought by Jesus from the Father and which is being transformed, transferred into our lives by the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of a large introduction, and now let's go into the idea, what it means. What is the fellowship of the Spirit? Three things that we need to remember. Uh, I am trying to, do, to be as practical as possible that everyone walking out from here would know what it means and what to do in relation to that. Number one, how fellowship of the Spirit happens, it's being attentive to the Holy Spirit. Like any mode of communication, kainainia is based on interaction between persons. Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a force. It's not an idea. It's not a complex of the worldview. No, it's a person. It's a real God and he interacts. So because of that, we need to know how to interact with him. He comes with that interaction. Actually, Kanenir represents a deeper sort of fellowship that comes with the common belonging to the save, of the saved to the Savior, to their Redeemer, to their Creator. That was accomplished at Calvary. We belong to Christ, belong to Christ, and we are inextricably linked to Him and to us. God gives that privilege, privilege of fellowship with God. This fellowship, this uh, attention to the Holy Spirit consists of several specific facets, and, and let me just briefly underline them. Number one, awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. As I just told you, we 
we don't see the Holy Spirit, and because of that, we forget about him. But quite often, if you would look uh, very carefully at your life, you forget even about people around you whom you've seen and hear. You can see people, and you can hear them, and you are so deep into your gadget that you just forgot that you have a brother, or your mom is asking you for third hour or ready to do something. Quite often, we forget about even physically seeing people that we can see and touch. And of course, much more, to a much greater degree, we forget about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is real. He lives around us and He lives with us. If you are a Christian, if you had been born again, the Holy Spirit lives in you. This is why Jesus was explaining to his disciples, uh, John 14, verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, helper just like me, he said. But they could see Jesus and touch him, but they will not be able to see the Spirit. But he explains to them, he will be with you forever. This is actually one of the differences between New Testament believers and Old Testament believers because Old Testament believers experience from time to time the presence of the Spirit. But for the New Testament believers, Jesus is saying He will be with you forever. If you're a Christian, the Spirit of God is with you forever. Doesn't matter where you are, and doesn't matter what you do, and doesn't matter what kind of thoughts in your mind. Are you paying attention to him or not? Are you aware that he is here or not? He's still here. That's, that's a very interesting and very important thing. Remembering God's presence is very important. You remember that uh, one of the key qualities that uh, first person who had, had been translated into heaven, uh, raptured to heaven without experiencing death, his name is Enoch, uh, that notable thing about him was that he walked with God, Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not where God took him. Every person here on earth walk here, walks here and uh, God uh, in the presence of God. But Enoch was different because he walked being aware. He walked with God. We have the same issue just from different sides with Jacob. You remember that he had God with him and, and he did not remember that. You remember that time when he was running from his brother and he was running to his uncle and at the, at the, uh, on the way he, he spent the night and he saw that, you remember, angels coming down from heaven and raising up to heaven. And what happened there is very interesting. Genesis 28, 16, then Jacob awoke awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know that. Look at the life of Jacob, and you will see how much trouble he experienced. Just because of that, he did not remember that God was with him. He was living like there is no God. He was living just taking into consideration all the physical things that he, he was able to see and not remembering God. Many biblical writers emphasize that they have focused their attention on the Lord and His presence. Psalm 17, 15, As for me, I shall behold your faith in righteousness. We cannot behold face of God physically. What he means, I, I shall behold your face, it means I will direct my attention toward you. Or uh, Prophet Micah, writes in 7, chapter 7, verse 7, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. This is conscientious decision. I will wait for the Lord of my salvation. My God will hear me. One of Israel's the most significant problems that Israel as a nation had, that they were forgetting God all the time. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12 
we see how it sums up that bad experience that Israel had. When Jacob went into Egypt and Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God. That's a problem. Even they, when they had experienced miracles and God's direct involvement in the, into their lives, they, they forgot it. This is why New Testament reminds us, and I, I uh, had, uh, had one passage caught my attention that when Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy at that time was a pastor of the large church, one of the best churches at that time, Ephesians, the uh, church at Ephesus, uh, the church, very influential church. And he writes in a very interesting reminder. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. This is what Timothy had to remember. Remember, hey, you are a pastor. Remember Jesus Christ. And of course, if a pastor needs to be reminded about that, all of us, we need to be reminded. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember the reality. So this is the first aspect of the Holy Spirit's fellowship, being aware of his actual presence in our lives. Number two, attention to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not mute. Holy Spirit speaks. He is a spirit of communication. He communicates. He is a spirit of fellowship. He wants to connect with you. And when we come to this point, quite often we think about something that uh, you know, certain denominations are promoting, hearing voices, maybe just experiencing some kind of ecstatic feelings or something like that. But it's much more simpler, everything. You know, the Holy Spirit communicated the truth of God in a very clear, a very objective, very identifiable and verifiable way. He did it through the Holy Scriptures. That's the number one. Second Peter verse 1, and there are a number of passages, I will give you just one. Uh, verse 20, knowing first, this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture come, comes from someone, uh, someone's own interpretation, interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, when, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. He is revealing truth. He is communicating truth. And the greatest minister of the Holy Spirit which was ever done was the producing of God's Word. He filled those human agents with truth, with a supernatural work. And he made them able to produce actual word of God, words of God. They put it together. And this word, people, friends, this word has life-giving power. It's not just ordinary book. Like you read philosophies or you, look, you read history or you, you read some kind of self-help books. No, 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 no. This is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. This is something that he produced to communicate to you, my friend. The God himself. He's revealing God to us from the pages of Scripture. And this is why Scripture in many places over and over again speaks about the importance of us being fed by the Scripture because this is a life-giving source. First Peter 2, verse 1 through 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk 
that by it you may grow into salvation. Friend, if you don't love the Word of God, if you don't long to the Word of God, to that spiritual milk, you will never grow. Never. There's no way. You may have physical muscles. You may have your mind exercised. You, you may have your career developed or whatever, but your soul will be a baby, still be an infant. Why? There's only one way. The only, only one way to feed your soul is the fellowship of the Spirit through the Word of God. This is what God is doing. John 15, 26, we read, Jesus himself is saying, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, spirit of truth, it's not spirit of ecstasy, kind of ecstatic experience. It's not spirit of supernatural kind of focus pocus, that you look and you are amazed. Yeah, it's this is the spirit. No. He is the spirit of truth. This is his primary characteristic. God sent his spirit to communicate truth to your soul, to my soul. This is the supernatural way of getting together with God, getting fellowship with God. Receiving the fellowship of the spirit means to consciously immerse ourselves into the word, into the scripture, set aside specific time, to attentively read the scriptures, understanding that the Lord himself speaks to us through it. Now what, I'm just amazed what's, what's going on with the contemporary Christianity. Never before the Bible was so forgotten among Christians. Never before. Never before we experienced that Total illiteracy, biblical illiteracy among Christians. We are just too busy. We have a bunch of telegram channels to look. We, we have a bunch of uh, social networks to check. We have a lot of things to do and we have a lot of pleasures to catch. And because of that, we just don't have time for Scripture. But we want to be spiritual. We want to have community. We want to have fellowship. And of course, what kind of community you will have if, you, if you're empty inside and you meet with another person who is empty inside, you just have that loud emptiness together. You'll watch movies that are empty and emptying you up even more. You will have conversations which have no, do, not, do not carry any significant spiritual. And then we all are Christians, and we all celebrate Christianity, and we, of course, are opposed to homosexuality and all of those deviations. But we just don't have spiritual power. We just don't, we, we don't know what it is in reality. I guess it's simple. But there's number three. Of course, uh, I have to rush because I have something more to say and I can, I can go deep into those things which are really concerning. They can, it, it concerns me. What we, we experience today, it really, it's real concerning. Number three is meditation of the Word of the Holy Spirit. So awareness of the presence. Do you want to have experience fellowship of the Spirit? Number one, be attentive, which starts with awareness that Holy Spirit's presence. If you are a Christian, He's present with you. Number two, give attention to what He speaks about, to His testimony. Number three, meditate on it. This is why it is very important to start the day with the Word of God. Some people say, no, I, I read it during a lunch break. That's good. Or I read the Bible at evening. That's also good. But you need something to feed on your thought process during the day. This is why if you don't have much time, just, just spend enough time to get some nuggets from the Scripture that would carry your mind through the day 
that you would think about that. You know, meditating on, on the testimony of the Spirit is actually to reflect on what you have read and look through the lens of that at yourself, at circumstances around you, at the people around you, interpreting life through the Word of God, through the truth of God. And this is what it means, fellowship of the Spirit. And when you do that, you will, if you do that, you will do that prayers uh, with a prayer, prayerfully. Because you just can't look at the world and not to pray. Look at the Word of God and look at what happens around. And look at your own failures and look at the people around you. And you will be reaching out to, the, to God and asking His work in your heart and in the... In the people around you. Psalm 1, very famous passage. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the uh, seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Lord, the law of the Lord, and he, on his law he meditates day and night. And look what happens. He is like a tree planted by the stream of water that yields its fruits in its season. And its leaves does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. This is a very clear explanation that the word of God should be an object of our meditation. Ongoing meditation. And this is what we see Psalmists uh, did. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 14. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. And fix my eyes on your ways. Look what's, what's going on here. This is a real fellowship of the Spirit. He meditates on God's Word. And then he, through that lens, he, can, he is able to see ways of God. To interpret it, to understand. This is real spirituality. This is real fellowship of the Spirit. Or Psalm 63 Look what he is writing about his experience. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with my joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed. Listen, my friend, when is the last time when you woke up in the middle of night and you think about the Lord? This is a source of joy. This is what it means to have fellowship of the Spirit. This is the way of the true eternal life which, present, which is present in, in our lives here on earth. Regular meditation on the Word not only gives us satisfaction in God, but also allows us to see the events of our lives from God's point of view. Psalm 73, you remember that famous story of Asaf who was... Uh, cut up in the world around him and he saw what's going on with people and he, he was envying those unbelieving people. And it was going on to the point, verse 17, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. To come to the sanctuary of God means to enter God's presence. Understand that God is with you. Communicate with him. God, his point of view upon those issues that he is dealing with. So, this is number one. Being attentive to the Holy Spirit. This is number one. Step number one, how to have fellowship with the Spirit. But there is number two, conversation with the Holy Spirit. So, one thing is I'm aware the Spirit is real. I understand that he speaks to me and I am attentive to, to the word of God and I meditate on it. But number two, I answer. I communicate back. I talk to him. Quite often people, when they, when they talk about that, they don't understand that. Talking to the Holy Spirit, they think it's only charismatics do that. But in reality, in reality this is what happens. We all pray to God the Father in the, in the name of Jesus because there is no other way for us to get to enter into, into the presence of God. But we all do that through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. 
We all. Actually, you know, God is present here now in the form of the third person of Trinity, the Holy Spirit. If you pray, there is no other way. You just pray to the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one whom God had sent to us to communicate. And not just to communicate with us. The Holy Spirit has a very important function. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, 20, yeah, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, ought to. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with growing in too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit sent by the Father and the Son to be our comforter and our advocate. This is what he does. He knows you personally. If you are a child of God, my friend, he knows you personally much, much better than you yourself know yourself. He was sent by God the Father to know you, to work with you, to help you, to comfort you, to lead you, to make sure that you will come to the end. And because of that, when you, my friend, pray, you know what happens? Spirit, Spirit knows your needs much, much better than you can ever formulate it, that you could put together in your thoughts, that you could express it in your words. He understands you much better because he is dedicated. He was sent by the Father to you, to your life, my friend. And because of that, he intercedes for you personally. This is why we pray to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we pray to the Father. We pray to the Trinity. We pray to the Godhead, to to God himself. But the point of connection, this is the only point of connection, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which is present in your life. So prayer as means of talking to God is a real tool for fellowshipping with him. Through prayer, we become more conscious about God. We become aware of God, and in light of his person, we better understand life. We better understand ourselves. We better understand uh, circumstances around us. And this is why prayer, true prayer, quite often becomes an instrument of bringing inner shalom into our hearts. You remember Philippians 4? When Paul is writing verses 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. This is the result of the fellowship of the Spirit, friend. This is our purpose. Our purpose is is to enter into prayer and come out of it with that supernatural peace of Christ, which supersedes human understanding. Jude, Jude 1, verse 20, 21, he writes, But you, beloved, being, uh, you're building yourself up in, the, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. This is what he's talking about. Romans 8, another example. You know, sometimes we don't have, we don't have ability to pray. Actually, I missed one verse which, which, you, which I really need to point. It's Ephesians 6.18. Ephesians 6.18, he's speaking about the spiritual warfare, and he is uh, underlining an important thing. He's saying prayer at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Look what he's saying. Pray every prayer. Use every opportunity to pray. Pray silently, pray out loud, pray publicly, 
pray in private, pray with friends, pray just with your own soul when you have the, the only ability just to express Abba Father and you don't have ability to put together your thoughts. So that's number two. Number three, very quickly, submission to the Holy Spirit. You know, the fellowship of the Spirit is not just about spending time together. The real purpose of the fellowship of the Spirit is bringing us into the position that we could live together with God and cooperate with Him. This is why submission to the Holy Spirit is a very essential part of that fellowship. Romans 8, 14, we read, For all who are led by the Spirit are the sons of, of God. Quite often when we read about people who are led by the Spirit, we think about super Christian. Yeah, they are led. Yeah, I understand Moses was led by the Spirit. Yeah, I understand Peter was definitely led by the Spirit. But me? But look what's here. For all who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit. What it means? It means that God sent His Spirit to lead you, my friend. Not just to educate you. Not just help you to have a good time, to experience that peace. No, He sent His Spirit to take you, my friend, my brother and my sister, and really lead you through life. You, you personally. What does it mean, really quickly? We know that guidance of the Holy Spirit is one of the most significant spiritual blessings that we have because we are adopted by God through Christ. We are human beings. We become agents of God's actions, His freedom, His love, His wisdom, His power, His soul-transforming word. And that's why Scripture warns us not to resist or quench the Spirit. Second, First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verses 16 through 22, we read, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, and then do not quench the Spirit. You know how we quench the Spirit? You know how you quench people, people quench you? When you see your son, and you are saying to him, Hey, don't do that. Hey, do this better. Hey, this life would be much better. This way of life would be much better. And he's continuing to ignore you. You know what he's doing? He's quenching you. This is exactly what happens when we ignore the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit speaks to us. He actually puts together circumstances. And even now, even today, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that you are here. And that we are speaking about that. That you hear that. And you today may be attentive to what he's saying and react toward that, on, or you can quench it. You can brand, brush it off and come out of that service and say, hey, Alexis just preached very well. Or maybe saying even, or even forgetting about this. But unless you will react on what the Spirit is prompting you, my friend, you will be quenching the Holy Spirit. Or there's another problem that we have, Ephesians 4.29. We see that let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we can quench the Holy Spirit when we ignore Him, but we grieve the Holy Spirit when we destroy what He is doing. You know what's right, written here? The, the very, very clear example when Holy Spirit is building up souls around us and we come down and we just tear them apart. And we are saying something which is not building up. We are offering, let's spend the time in an empty movie and 
you yourself getting yourself in trouble, and you actually are taking your friends and destroying what the Holy Spirit tried to do in them last Sunday during the service. Now what you're doing? You're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're working against the Holy Spirit. That's serious. We live in a spiritual world. And the Holy Spirit is really present, and the Holy Spirit is really working in us, and we can either cooperate with Him, or we can go against Him. So this is why submission to the Holy Spirit is a very important part of, of the fellowship of the Spirit. This is why in Ephesians 5.18 we read, but do not get drunk with wine, for it is the debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So make sure that every part of your life is under control of the Spirit. We're getting close to the final prayer, and I just want to just sum up, just for all of us, some of the results, why we need that. They are very clear, and it's actually a huge topic, and I was debating about doing two sermons on that, but decided, to, okay, we just need to, to be concise, and we need to, to get that straight shot, that we need to understand what it means. So the results of the fellowship of the Spirit, number one, victory over sin and flesh. All of us are fighting with the flesh. And the only source of power to overcome flesh in the Spirit. Fellowship of the Spirit. Romans 8, 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, but if by the Spirit, you need to underline this word, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. My friend, you don't have other power to overcome your flesh, just the Spirit of God. And if you don't exercise the fellowship of the Spirit, you will not have power of doing that. Oh, you know, my brothers and sisters, how many times I had seen people in my office who are genuinely saying to me, yes, I understand I am a sin. I understand I am doing something that I should not do, but I don't have strength to overcome that. And I see that. And I understand that he or she does not have strength to overcome that. And the reason why, there is no fellowship of the Spirit in your life. There's no way of getting that strength into your soul. I cannot overcome your sin. I just can't. I can pray about you. I can direct you toward that. But only your spirit is capable of overcoming your temptations. And for that, you need the power of the Spirit of God. You need that fellowship. You need not just to talk about that. You need to know what it is. You need to practice it. Number two, sanctification, which is quite close, is the work of the Spirit. Second Thessalonians 2.13 but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you in the first, as the first fruit to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit. We are sanctified. Number three, which is related to that, is transformation into the image of Christ. So we are becoming more Christ-like as a result of the fellowship of the Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, uh, 3 uh, 17, 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faith, beholding the glory of the Lord, this is what the Spirit does through the Word of God, pointing us to Christ, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 
Growing in wisdom is the result of, of the work of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. That's a result of the work of the Holy Spirit. Inner fr freedom and strength of your person is a direct result of the fellowship of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of that is a direct result of fellowshipping with the Spirit. Before we pray, I just want to underline that this is what we all need. If you are a young mother... If you would get immersed yourself in the fellowship of the Spirit early in the day, I understand it means losing half an hour of sleep. But it's not losing, it's investing. You'll get strength which would carry you and give you peace and ability to be kind to your kids and to have that patience that you badly need as a result of the fellowship of the Spirit. If you are a man who spent the whole day working, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will give you confidence, will give you hope, will help you to have proper attitude to everything which, you are, which is around you. This is what we need. A young girl, as she learns the riches of the fellowship of the Spirit, will find joy and deep contentment that makes her independent of people and what they think and the circumstances around. And exactly the same we could say about the elderly who are feel abandoned and just alone. Or about business people who are just badly need, needed to that, that direction from the Spirit which would put the right purpose of life in front of their eyes. The list goes on and on. We'll spend time in prayer now. And if you're a Christian... I would like you to take time and think. Just think of a time when you experience the real fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Just try to remember that time. Try to get back that taste. What, what does it mean? That time when you had that personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And then coming out of that, Answer a question. What prevents you from having that kind of regular experience regularly? And number three, are you ready today to dedicate yourself to have fellowship of the Spirit? It's a regular part of your life. Let's kneel down and spend some time in silent prayer. Talk to God and meditate on what you have heard. Our Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to kneel down before you. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for your son Jesus who died for us at the cross, opening to us the throne of grace that we now can come before it. And we know that we are adopted as sons and daughters. We know that you love us as your only begotten Son. Thank you, Lord, for 
the Holy Spirit that you have sent to us, who really is present in, in our lives, present in our hearts, who is really working in us, prompting us to have that true fellowship. And I ask, Lord, for every one of us, you see every soul who are here, you see, Lord, our dependence upon you. You see, Lord, that we need to have that deep relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to have it. Lord, bless us. We need your work of the Spirit. We need your wisdom of the Spirit. We need, Lord, that special grace that today we would be able to, to focus on you that we will, would be attentive to what you are saying, that we would become obedient to your truth, that you are communicating to us through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.